Okay, <clears throat> welcome everyone. We're going to officially get started. Uh, I'm Grant Brenner. I'm a psychiatrist and a psychotherapist in Manhattan. I'm also uh, the one of the co-founders and CEO of Neighborhood Psychiatry, which is an insurance-based and self-pay psychiatric practice with psychotherapy and psychiatry. And I also write and blog and podcast. Please feel free to look me up. But this is not so much about me, but we wanted to offer you a very useful presentation. We know that during this pandemic time, people are especially challenged, both uh, adults in personal lives and with kids. And so it's my pleasure to welcome Craig Selinger. Uh, Craig Selinger is a New York State licensed language therapist with over 18 years of experience working professionally with a wide range of uh, a wide age range of people. He's very well qualified as an executive function coach. Uh, and uh, training in uh, speech and language uh, pathology and so on. Uh, Craig, I'll let you introduce yourself some more, but you can you can look him up online. And after Craig's presentation, Karen, how do you say your last name? Is it Sochi? Sochi. Sochi. Sochi uh, is trained in the Marie Kondo and Con Marie uh, method to help with uh, personal and home organization. And uh, of course, executive functioning and organization go hand in hand. So without any further ado, very pleased to turn it over to Craig. Hi, thanks for, for attending. We're very excited to be here. So uh, as you know, there's a bit of a time crunch. So I would I can go on and on and go on and speak about executive functioning for hours, but I have about 15 minutes. We will have time for questions. So, um, so I apologize, it's extremely, complicated topic and I will kind of reduce it. It would be more of a reductionist. So just I'm not trying to downplay executive functioning, but I'm just trying to give you a, a 15 minute presentation on, on something that is extremely wildly uh, complicated, multidisciplinary. So, um, so what is executive functioning? So you, there's lots of definitions out there and like anything else, people may argue what executive functioning is, what it's not. So in general, what it, what is it? It's basically when you're problem solving, when you have a goal in mind. Now, let's say you're like, I wake up in the morning, I brush my teeth. That's a goal, but you're not really problem solving. What happens is that when you're exposed to, let's say, uh, whatever the, the goal is, and it's something novel, something that's not automatic, your, your executive functioning, uh, called the prefrontal cortex, frontal lobe, which I'll show you a quick slide, gets activated. So it depends on the task demands. Um, so for example, let's say I said, all right, now I want you, let's say you're not a business person, you're not an entrepreneur, I want you to start a new business. It's an open-ended task, and that would involve a lot of executive functioning skills, unless, again, you have a lot of background knowledge in that area. Let's say I'm teaching your child a new board game, and it's novel, it's new, that's activating executive functioning. Now, you, when you think about executive functioning, what's particularly confusing, it's, it's specific to every individual and to the context. So let's say um, you found out like, all right, this weekend, you're going away for the weekend and you're going to see your in-laws, for example. <clears throat> you don't have time to pack till Friday afternoon um, and, and you're jumping on a flight. You're only, you're, you're taking one piece of luggage that you're putting under the plane. You Friday afternoon, evening, you don't have any distractions. You just need a few hours to pack. You pack, go to bed, and then you, you get to the airport, et cetera. So that might be an easy goal to accomplish. Now, let's say, again, the, the goal is to pack a suitcase. You know, that can also be a very complicated goal. Let's say, for example, now with your significant other, you've decided that you're going to share a suitcase. Now you have to work with an individual to problem solve about a visual spatial um, you know, set amount of space and, and how are we going to cooperate and get what we need in that suitcase, right? So that can be a different task. Let's say, for example, you get flooded with work and you're like, I have to take care of all this work. And now the next thing, it's, it's 12 o'clock midnight and you're like, I got to pack for this trip. I got to get up at 5 a.m. Again, same goal, but different context. So when we're talking about executive functioning, um, in general, you have to remember the context and also the individual and individuals involved. Um, let's see, that's me. All right, so here very quickly, here's a picture of the brain. Um, and then the front area is called the frontal lobe. And what's what, all you have to know about executive functioning is that 
it's the last part of the brain to develop. We thought that it was fully developed once you're in your early 20s. Now neuroscience is saying mid-20s. So we're actually not officially adults until we're, you know, we're in our mid, mid, mid-20s. And again, there, there's, there's individual differences. Um, there's people that look those with ADHD, which takes them even more time for their frontal lobes to develop. But it takes a, lo a long time. Um, and, and if you think about if you have a child, um, and particularly their middle school, high school, there's a lot of executive functioning demands, particularly if it's remote, and their brains are not fully developed. I'm just going to go skip this for a second, I'll come back to it. So again, there's lots of different definitions for executive functioning. Now, executive functioning can be broken down into many components. It, it, people argue what are the different components. Some people say three, some people say six, some people say eight. For this, for this discussion, it, it doesn't matter. It's just being aware that it's broken into different parts. So, um, so for example, one is inhibition. So let's say it's, let's say you have distractions. How do you, or temptations, let's call it, right? So, um, so one very famous study that was done was the marshmallow test with, with young children, where children were tempted, uh, there, would, there would be an adult in a room with a, a young child, I don't remember the specifics, but they would be presented with a marshmallow or marshmallows. And they and then the adult would give instructions to the child, the adult would leave. And then they would see how long the child can wait until they had the marshmallow. And and particularly in today's society, there's there our cell phones, you know, our, our electronic devices. It's 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 constantly these are drugs. And and it's how well can we avoid those temptations? Those temptations disrupt. Um, in terms of schooling, can disrupt, you know, how a, a student is listening to their teacher, how, how, you know, if they're supposed to be focused doing work, and as adults too, all, all the time, we're constantly dealing with um, disruptions. There's something called working memory. There's, you know, a lot of people don't realize there's, it's not just long-term, short-term memory. There's something called working memory. It's, it's like, an example is like you hold a piece of information while you're processing simultaneous information. This has happened to us. You go to the fridge, and you're like, all right, I'm looking for, I don't know, the leftover macaroni and cheese. And sometimes it's in front of your face and you're looking and you have the image in mind, macaroni, macaroni, and cheese. Maybe your partner put in a different type of Tupperware. So, and, and so you're, you're visually scanning, looking while you have something in mind. Um, and that's working memory. Um, and that's a huge piece, particularly for students. Um, that may have uh, working memory challenges, and it's really hard for them, um, particularly when they're distracted, to hold and retain information. And then there's something called cognitive flexibility. It's like how you can switch from like, one task to the next. And this is also with her jobs. Um, I'll give you a very quick example of an adult that we work with where she had a new job, and her job is really two different jobs, and she was having a lot of different, she would be very good with sustained attention with one job, but to, to switch to the next job, very difficult with that transition. Um, and, and so some people, in terms of executive functioning skills, they may have good working memories. Maybe they're very good at avoiding temptations, but the flexibility can be really devastating for them. So you can, you can have difficulties in, in one of the three areas. And also you may be okay in some of the all three areas, but it depends on the context. Maybe certain context really taxes your working memory, or maybe you're not getting enough sleep at night and, and your working memory is kind of reduced and you're having trouble retaining information. So again, it's, it's all these different factors that are involved. Um, so again, Peg Dawson and Richard, I pronounce it as Guerre, um, they, they break it down to 11 different areas. As you see, it can get pretty complicated. Just have a few more minutes. Um, all right. And then there's something called, let's go back, is uh, executive dysfunction. Now, here are just common characteristics of what's considered executive function dysfunction. Just because you, you or you've seen individuals exhibit these characteristics, it doesn't mean they have an executive functioning disorder. We all, we all have executive functioning weaknesses and strengths. We're all taxed in different environments. And uh, so don't think, oh my God, this is me. I have an executive. It, do it doesn't mean that. It's just being aware of, of some of the symptomology that might be uh, taxing, your, again, your executive functioning skills. Now, people that exhibit a lot of these so-called executive functioning behaviors, it's good to be aware of how, um, you know, context and your executive functioning skills, how they mingle, interact, and how what you can do to help. Now, I just have a few minutes, so just a few 
key points here, sorry, um, eight principles. This doesn't mean you have to go from principle one to two to three. These are just eight general principles. So I'll give you a very quick example. And Karen's actually going to give an example with, she's going to talk about the Eisenhower method. Um, and I can, and it, I can break any method down and, and it's involving these eight principles. So let's say email management, um, your, your inbox is blown up. It's a mess, right? And you want to use some sort of program to help organize, optimize your emails. So you have the program, um, could be number five, you're setting up a system, but that doesn't solve the problem. You have to learn how to use the system, right? That's number one. Number two is being respectful of individuals' developmental status. That's saying that if I have a new email system, I don't expect a seven-year-old to learn this developmental system. It may be more appropriate for those that are you know, 20 plus. Uh, you have to set routines. You have when you're learning something new, it has to. It really should be part of a routine, and you're practicing it. You have to monitor success. Sometimes you have a new system, you're practicing it, and there's glitches, and you have to figure out how to overcome those glitches. There's a motivation piece. Some, a lot of people, and, and Dr. Brenner can talk about this. They may have good intentions. Yes, I would love to set up an email system. I'm just not motivated, and there could be a plethora of reasons why there's this obstacle. It's a wall. It's an emotional blockage. There's a, I also, we work with a lot of people with that are avoidant. Avoid, avoidance is also, there's a lot of symptomology underlying avoidance. And, and Dr. Brenner may talk about also um, our, our past, which there could be reasons from our childhood that may decrease our motivation with, with current behavior. And then the final, the final things are sleep, diet, and exercise. And again, executive function, just think of its brain. So if you're sleeping well, you're eating well, you're exercising, you're optimizing your brain development or your brain. So the more you take care of yourself in general, the better you, are your executive functioning skills, the better you're able to problem solve, the be able to the, 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 increase your chances of, of working well with others. And then again, last one is expectations. So it's managing, you know, what you can do, um, what is expected that you can do based on what, what the goal is in a, in a nutshell. That was excellent. Is that, have you completed your presentation? Yeah. Okay, thank you. I know um, time can get away from people during webinars, so we've asked our presenters to, to be succinct, um, but where could people find some additional information? Oh, and uh, sure. So um, one, so I have a website called tempatutors.com. Um, you could go to the website. There's, there's information on executive functioning. You can email me, text me. Um, and I'm more than happy to provide any, any, if you have any questions, any information. Um, we also offer executive functioning coaching where we work with uh, primarily middle schoolers, high schoolers, college students, and, and even adults as well. And the reason we don't really work with elementary school age students is that again, it's developmentally, the, uh, the reality is that in terms of executive functioning in elementary school, it, their, their executive functioning skills are pretty, you know, they're pretty limited. So it's, it's a lot of the coaching really happens once they're in middle school and once they're older. But we do coach parents um, if they need some coaching sessions for how to help manage their, their younger child. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, I think a lot of parents, uh, I'll just I'll, I'll, I'll just mention one thought I have, uh, and I'm a, I'm a parent of young kids too. <clears throat> they expect their elementary school kids to function at a higher level of cognitive development, and that can create all kinds of parent-child relational problems. If, if you expect your kid to have the capacity to, for example, plan and keep track of time the way, the way you do, and they're just not yet wired for it, it's obviously going to create a lot of friction so for that age group, parenting coaching is the way to go. Yeah, I want to say one other thing um, based on what Dr. Benner was saying. So the other kind of, I don't want to say secret sauce, but when I, any, anyone that comes through us through Time of Tutors, I always speak to any potential client. And uh, it's the, re the, the relationship, unless we're working with an adult who's living on their own, um, which does happen, but a high percentage of our clients, um, we're dealing with dyads, we're dealing with relationships, it's all intermingled, and it's hard to extricate, you know, um, if let's say you have a child that maybe has executive functioning difficulties, you have, you have to look at the family dynamics, it's, it's mandatory.
Yeah, is this is obviously is very complex. And as you said, there's other factors that come into play. We'll have more time to talk through these things. I see one question about your website. I'm going to answer that in text now, and then we'll turn it over to Karen. Thank you, Karen. And if you need to unshare your screen, Craig, uh, so Karen can share. There you go. Okay. Let me share my screen. Thanks so much for having me today. Um, now let's see if I can get this pulled up here. One thing I'll mention while Karen's doing that is I think both of you are doing something that is extremely helpful for executive functioning is verbalizing to oneself what we're doing. So I find it very helpful, especially when I'm confronted, for example, with, you know, the ever present tech problems to say, okay, let me look for the button that helps me share my screen. Give me a minute. This is also something that psychologists call mentalizing where you're talking out loud about what's going on in your head which is very helpful for the other person. So I see you're sharing, so I will stop talking. No, that's fine. I, I think that talking to myself is probably one of the things I've learned to do best over the course of the pandemic, for sure. Um, I'm Karen Sochi. I am a master level KonMari consultant. I actually started my professional career as a clinical psychotherapist. I have an MSW. Um, got tired of that after doing it for a really long time. Loved clients, but all of the other stuff involved was really enough. So I decided I wanted to go into healthcare finance, went and got my MBA, absolutely hated it. Hated everything about healthcare finance. It was not for me. I missed working with clients, but I didn't want to go back into um, what I had done before, but I had always had a great passion for organization and systems and helping people try to find the best way for them to, you know, manage everything from their closets to their work life. So I became a professional home organizer and I learned that um, my background as a therapist was enormously helpful. Um, getting organized just pulls in so many emotions, um, so many things about ourselves that, that we have either been avoiding or trying to work against when in reality getting organized is about understanding yourself and finding what works for you. So my presentation, again, is going to be brief. I could fill 15 minutes over and over again, so I will do my best to stay succinct. In fact, I'm going to hit my little timer here so I don't lose track of time. Let's talk first about why disorganization is such a big deal. Now, you probably already know why it is for you personally, but let's talk about some statistics. Um, every year, $2.7 billion is spent replacing misplaced possessions, whether that is the um, chicken in a freezer that you wanted to use for Saturday night's dinner, or whether it's um, important documents, or whether it is, um, you know, toiletries or some, or tools or things that are, that are um, from small dollar value to big dollar value, we lose a lot of things. If you are like me, you will remember a time when you tossed away a very expensive pair of earrings, not realizing that they were buried under a stack of papers. Um, so I even have my own personal experiences with losing something that was of great value. Um, for all of us, of course, it's going to be a different statistic, as is this next one, which is that people spend up, an, spend up to an hour a day looking for lost things. Now, that means five minutes for your keys, maybe two minutes for the, the pair or the match to the pair of shoes that you want to wear. Um, maybe it's 20 minutes looking for your kid's homework that needs to go to school that day. It could be a lot of things. And of course, for some people, it's not an hour a day. For some, it's even more than an hour a day. But over a year's time, that's really a lot of time spent looking for things. Um, some statistics from the National Association of Professional Organizers, of which I'm a member. Um, within a year, 45% of people who took the survey remember that they had been late paying a bill. 29% missed a doctor's appointment. 10% missed a social engagement. 3% missing um, to missing an important work meeting. Now, this is an average population. So if we're looking at the ADHD population, of course, 
that could be much larger. The percentage numbers, I think, would probably go up a lot more. And you also can probably think of other things that being disorganized has caused you to miss or um, to not function as well as you would have liked to. One of the most important things I want to leave you with today is that getting organized, especially while you are managing ADHD, is a tailor-made process. There is not one size that fits all. Um, if there were, it would make this whole thing so much easier, but everyone is different. Um, you can change your mechanisms for managing uh, organization. However, what works best for you is what works best for you. And um, getting to find what how to optimize your organization, whether it's your closet or your work, is really about trying and testing. Now, some of the ideas I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a lot of basic tips today. And I want you to think about, could I give this a try? Um, if it doesn't work for you, that's okay. Even when something doesn't work, it's really valuable because it's telling you, it's giving you information about what isn't right for you. It's like trying on clothes. You know, you try on three pairs of pants and maybe one of them is perfect, but the other two are just not for you. Um, it's the same thing with trying on techniques and tips uh, for getting organized. So let me just give you a few. I'll start with the most basic formula for getting organized. And this applies to everything from your coat closet to your, um, your office desk to your pantry to whatever it is that you want to get organized. There is a very simple formula. It's very simple, but people get really overwhelmed when they open up the door to their closet and don't know where to start. The first thing is you want to sort and edit first. So disorganized people love the container store. The container store is like Disneyland for disorganized people. You walk up and down those aisles and you see things you didn't even know you needed, but you know they're the answer to all of your disorganization disorgan problem. Now, I love the container store. There's lots of things there that I certainly have utilized, um, but you don't want to do that first because what happens is you buy a bunch of bins, um, you know, for $39.99 and you start shoving things into bins and it might look nice, but it's not organized. So what I suggest is that you don't even think about the organizational step until you have sorted and edited. Now, I like the term sort and edit as opposed to declutter. And certainly I like it a lot more than the word purge because to me, and this is a very key concept in KonMari as well, is the idea that what you are doing is deciding what you do want around you instead of just trying to get rid of everything. I have clients who don't get rid of that much stuff um, and that's fine. Uh, I have clients who get rid of, who get rid of tons and 50% of the, of the things that they own go out the door. But it's really about deciding what you wanna have with you as opposed to how much can you get rid of. Um, and, and to me, that's the editing process. It's saying, what do I want? What things do I wanna have around me? What is working for me? What is part of my life today? Um, and then like letting go of the rest. Then you organize and organization is really about making sure that things are easy to put away. It's not about, it is, I mean, it's great if it looks pretty. It's great if things are um, easy to find, that's certainly important. But I find that the biggest hurdle to sustaining after you have done editing and, and organizing is making sure that things are easy to put away. If they're not, we know what happens. They end up on top of the cabinet, they end up in piles in the dining room table. And making piles is really about delayed decisions. I don't know what to do with this mail. I don't know if I need this or not. So I'm just gonna make a, I'm gonna start a pile right here. And then the homework assignment comes in or the papers that need to be signed for your child's field trip when we get to take field trips again. You're not exactly sure what you're supposed to do with that. Or maybe you think, oh, I don't really know if I'm supposed to turn it in now or later. So I'm just going to add it to the pile. And before you know it, you have a stack of delayed decisions. So in order to avoid that kind of thing, making sure that you have a way to sustain your organization is super important. Getting organized is no fun. Going through everything that you own and, and deciding whether or not you need it and then deciding where it should go is a really overwhelming process. You don't wanna to have to keep doing it over and over again. So by following really just these three steps, this three-step formula, and of course it's not that simple, right? But it is really kind of the framework for making decisions going forward. 
about how you can make your life a little more organized. Now I'm gonna give you just some tips, some general tips. So we'll start with time management. Having a list I think is critical. And it's not a kind of a traditional way of making a list. There are lots of planners and online apps and fancy notebooks and all kinds of things that are produced. Usually you can get them around the first of the year. Um, beautiful, beautiful notebooks, beautiful binders, um, all kinds of things, expensive apps. Um, and a lot of times people buy those things and they never use them. I have found that the simpler, the better. I have one list on my computer that goes to all of my devices and the list has two, basically two columns. And the first column is what can I do that day of, of the things that I need to do? What can be done right now? So if I had five minutes, and I could sit down, could I get started on this thing? Uh, that goes on one list, that's my to-dos. Then the other list will be things that I wanna remember, but I can't necessarily address at that moment. It might be that I made a phone call and I'm waiting for them to get back to me. Uh, it could be an email. It could be that you're waiting to hear from um, someone about when they're going to start a project in your home um, or a work project. Um, it could be anything, you can't necessarily do anything about at that moment. So you don't want to confuse it with your to-do list and you don't want to forget it. I have found that my brain is a very poor storage locker. I don't want to have to remember things if at all possible. So whenever I think of something, um, we're out of paper towels, I put it on the list. I don't try to remember it because what happens is I then begin to feel anxious about what I might be forgetting. So to whatever degree I'm able to just put things down on that list, and it's got to be simple because I've got to be able to get to it right away, um, uh, the better I am at feeling confident that I am managing the things that I need to manage that day. The other thing, and this is one for me, absolutely, give yourself more time than you think you will need. Um, one of the things that I find so amusing about the Google map directions is how much time it thinks it's gonna take me to walk 10 blocks. I am a fast walker, but I will tell you right now that Google is always off by many, many minutes. So I try to ignore what Google says it's gonna take when I'm making my plans for when I need to leave um, and give myself more time. You know, it's really nice. If you, if you are a chronic, uh, uh, just on time or maybe a little late person, and that one day you actually get someplace early or you know that you have plenty of time and you're strolling instead of rushing, it will change your entire perspective. So to whatever degree you can, try to build in more time for a task or uh, trying to get somewhere uh, to your, to your um, destination. Uh, create a routine of what can be planned. Now, I think a lot of times what, what happens is when people decide that they're going to get organized, they fill every minute of their day with some planned activity because they wanna make sure that they're using their time well and they're getting things done and they're getting to the gym or they're getting that exercise or they're getting those chores completed. But what happens is you begin to feel overwhelmed and almost um, it almost becomes oppressive to think in terms of, okay, all right, now I'm supposed to be doing this. My suggestion is that give yourself just a few things that you absolutely wanna get done that day. And if it's going to the gym or you know, making an appointment, things that you must do or that, are, that you want to do, then that will help a lot toward um, uh, being able to feel comfortable with your schedule and not feeling like you're over schedule. Task management, break down big projects. When it comes to getting organized, what I find my clients suffer with most is feeling overwhelmed with how big the project is. Break it down and think in terms of what can I do right now without needing any additional resources or input or information? Right? What Do I have everything at my disposal to take care of, whether it's to write an email or to do your part of the project? Um, and how can I focus on those things instead of getting, getting overwhelmed with the fact that my significant other or my kids are so disorganized? Think in terms of what you have control over and break your projects down into smaller increments. Work in small increments of time. Um, there is absolutely uh, a, a, a 
a well-known adage. It starts with um, some of um, some work that's been done for a long time, getting things done, um, where five minutes is a sweet spot to getting started on any task. In other words, if you say, I know this is going to take a really long time, but what part of this can I do in just five minutes? Let's say you've decided you're going to clean your apartment and it's a, a lot and it feels really overwhelming and you'd much rather just sit down and watch some Netflix. That's me for sure. But if I think in terms of, okay, I'm just going to um, dust or I'm just going to clean the bathroom. Um, I'm just going to clean part of the bathroom that only took me five minutes, or I'm going to, um, you know, even something as simple, I'm going to sort the recyclables, something that takes five minutes. If you get those five minutes done and you're, that's it, then that's fine. Come back and give it another five minutes when you're ready. A lot of people find that once they get started, they're able to go on further. Um, and then maybe you get the whole apartment clean that day. Maybe you get part of it clean, but you will at least feel some sense of accomplish, accomplishment um, that will that will help you in the future complete even more of that task. Now, and I think this is one of the most important things, embrace your space. This is about understanding how you work best and building upon it as opposed to fighting against it. Uh, if you are a person who needs to see all of your, um, your work in front of you, your documents, if you like to print things out and you like to have stacks of books that you are, are or researching or whatever it might be, or projects or, or crafts or whatever it is, um, you might be a person who just needs to be able to see it all or you're worried that you're losing something. Instead of making huge stacks of things, decide that you're gonna go with it. You're gonna buy some bins that are attractive. You're gonna um, get some files and you're gonna try to put each type of item into an individual container so that you can feel confident that you have what you need in front of you, but yet you're not overwhelmed with this huge stack of things that you know are important, but you don't know what's at the bottom of the stack. It might be more important than what's at the top of the stack. Um, this way you can divide your work out a little more and embrace the way that you need to utilize your space. Or you might be a person who cannot have anything on your desk or you're just distracted. Um, what's really important about that type of person is that things are easy to put away, just as I was saying earlier. If you can't put things away easily, if your file cabinets or your pantries or your closet is so full of jammed of things that are not necessarily what you need, then putting things away becomes a big chore. And what happens? We end up not doing it. And again, we have big stacks. We've already decided that I, as a person, work better with a clean desk, but I don't have a way to clean my desk. So that's kind of the concept that you want to start with. You want to start with who you are and how you can best embrace that person. So Craig mentioned the Eisenhower method. This is the modified Eisenhower method. It was actually something that General Eisenhower either invented or people on his team invented, but it was about how to decide what action to take. Now it's been modified to embrace not only tasks, but also things like email. So very quickly, I'm going to run through the four Ds. And if, if this appeals to you, I'm hoping that you'll think in terms of how to decide what to do with your email, for example. Just start small. Start with an email or maybe even the mail that comes today. The four Ds, delete. Delete's the best one. Delete says, I absolutely don't need this right now. Um, and if I do decide that I need this, I know that I can get it later. So this might be um, uh, information about a sale. This might be information, um, you know, that at this point you can't imagine that you're going to need it. Maybe it's a schedule for something that's going to be happening later this year. But you know that if you needed that, you could find it again. Or maybe you just don't need it. Maybe it's just junk. And maybe you can just let it go. Delegate. So delegate means that someone else could use this information. Maybe you're hanging on to it because you want to share it with someone or you want to give it to someone or you're waiting for someone to do something. So maybe someone needs to get back to you about something. So you are essentially saying, I delegate this task to you. I'm sending this email to you and I'm going to get it out of my inbox, for example. I'm going to get it off of my desk. Delay. So delay says, there's nothing I can do about this right now. However, 
I do want to do something with this in the future. So this could be a wedding invitation uh, that's for a wedding that's happening in the fall. And you definitely want to go, but you don't need to do anything with it right now. Uh, so you're delaying that, that, that process. Maybe you are, have been invited to an event that's happening in a month or two months, let's say, and the RSVP isn't due for a month and you're not sure if your significant other will want to go with you. So you need to check with them. So maybe you put it in your calendar to check a week from now with them to see if they've decided. Um, the last one is due. And again, these are the things that you can actually do something about this moment. Now, let's go back to that wedding invitation, right? So you get a wedding invitation. You want to make sure that the person that you would be going with is interested in going. So you can delay that decision, but you're also delegating it. You are saying, do you want to go to this? Let me know in a week. All right. So then you put it on your calendar or maybe you leave it in your inbox because it's something that you're going to get back to relatively soon. Um, then your significant other says, yes, I definitely want to go. So the next step you might say, well, I need to find out if they have a gift registry. So you get in touch with, I don't know, whoever's planning the wedding and you say, hey, does this couple have a, a gift registry? So you've kind of delegated a question to someone else. Again, you've delegated, you don't have to worry about it right now until you hear from them, right? So then they get back to you and they say, yes, they are registered at Bed Bath & Beyond. So you have a do, there's nothing else you need to do or you need to know at that moment that you can go to the registry and order the gift and get it then off of your plate. So then you've gone back to delay. So now there's nothing more for you to do until the, until the week before the wedding. Another tip, if it's a birthday or an event or uh, an appointment, anything that you need to get to, set an alert for a week before. I learned this when it came to birthdays. I would set all my, I had all of my birthdays in my calendar, all of my family's birthdays, but I wouldn't know about the birthday. I wouldn't remember the birthday. Of course, it was somebody close I would, but for a lot of people in my family, I couldn't remember when their birthdays were, except on the day of the birthday. Well, it's too late to send a birthday card on the day of the birthday. So now for all of those birthdays, out of town relatives, you know, even in town relatives, so I remember to go get a card, I have an alert set for one week before their birthday. You can do that with anything. So a week before the wedding, you wanna make sure that you have what you need to go to the wedding. Um, you set an alert so that you know, so it doesn't sneak up on you. Anyway, those are the four Ds. So what I would like for you to consider is if any one of these tips resonates with you, they seem to be something that can help you um, resolve an issue, then just give it a try today. Maybe give it a little try, decide to try it on, try it on like you would a pair of pants and see if it works for you and build on that. Um, if it doesn't work, then again, you you learn something really important. That particular technique does not work for me. And then you can put it aside and try something else. That is really what getting organized is all about. You can find me, I'm Karen at thesereneham.com. I also have a podcast, the Spark Joy podcast. Craig has been on our podcast. Um, we're on hiatus right now, but there are lots of episodes that might be really helpful um, to you. I do do home organizing and virtual organizing and work with Craig when it comes to executive functioning um, for families in particular. Um, and again, reach out, always happy to answer questions and to, uh, to share what I know about getting organized. Okay, I'm done. That was great. Uh, thank you. And, uh, you know, I, I, I like one of the last tips I find really helpful, which is just to right away put it in a reminder calendar. Um, and one thing I've noticed uh, with, with sort of how I can, I can trick, sort of trick myself sometimes, though you, you never know how much of that is like on purpose and how much of it is just an attentional lapse. But, you know, as, as psychotherapists, we know sometimes people have emotional motivations that we, we can struggle with. Um, so my point is that I notice sometimes when there's a, that moment, right? You have that choice. Okay, um, I have a call next week that I just, I just emailed someone. I said, okay, let's talk next week on Wednesday at 2 p.m. And I tell myself, okay, I'll, I'll put that in my calendar later. <laughs> and there's almost never a good reason to delay it. And what I notice more, more often than not is that when I make that choice in my head to, to do it later, I almost always forget. Any thoughts about that either, Karen or Craig? Well, I can tell you right now that, that I, I know that there's no way I'm going to forget this. I'm not going to forget this password that I just set up. I'm not going to forget that I need to stop by this store. 
I can guarantee you I'm going to forget it. <laughs> so that's why I've learned. But that's a hard learned experience, right? I, I only know that because of all the times I'm absolutely sure I'm going to remember something and I don't remember it. So now I know, put it on the list. It's much easier that way. I just want to make a point, uh, Dr. Brenner. Um, sometimes the most you, you, you call best... me Grant. Oh, okay, thanks, Grant. I wasn't sure. Uh, thanks. Uh, so, so, yeah, no problem. So sometimes the most minute minute task you you want to avoid. So I, I think sometimes people don't realize that literally something that can take ten seconds. Um, people are like, oh, I got to log back in. I got to go to my calendar, um, and they just you know and. It, and sometimes it doesn't, you don't execute. So in terms of executive functioning, it could be, you know, a huge goal, a huge task, or sometimes literally something that can take seconds and you still can't execute for, for whatever, you know, the, whatever the reason is. It's very complicated. So let me go to the QA <clears throat> um, from one part, one uh, attendee is asking, I think this is to Karen. Where is your list located? Electronic paper app, et cetera. I think you're muted, Karen. So I have what I call my brain dump, my brain dump. And this is my to-dos. I, I consider it my brain dump because I don't want to hold anything in my brain. I put everything here. It's just, the, it's just the Apple iPhone app, but it could be anything. What I like about this is it goes to all of my different computers and my devices so that I can find it wherever I need. That is just a, it's a basic list. Um, and you know, if you look at this, some of this is uh, only gonna make sense to me if I look at it, but I at least know what it is. So you know, appointments that I need to make, calls that I need to make, um, waiting for somebody to get back to me about something. I even have a, one of the things here is that we've decided that in, in 2023, we're gonna go to Albuquerque because apparently there's some eclipse or something happening. My husband's totally into this. Um, so I have it on my list that is, Soon as possible, I have to go make hotel reservations for right. 2023. So it can be anything. It can be something big and little. It's just, what can I do with this at that time? Um, and I just click them off. But it could be whatever works for you. Some people really like, there's something about the act of writing things that helps them remember or helps them integrate that, that information. I think that's completely valid. If you want to get a beautiful um, book that you can write things in, great. But I work with a lot of people who have dozens of journals and books that they've purchased with the intent of, of, of using that to stay organized and they never get open. So whatever works for you is the right thing. Right. You, you talked about going to a, an organization store and how appealing it can be because like, we might have a fantasy that we're going to buy this stuff and then our problems are solved. But that doesn't keep us from needing to do that, that work. And that can lead to a vicious cycle of kind of failing. Um, and, and a reminder to please ask questions in the QA, not the chat box. Um, so, you know, there was a follow up. I don't have an Apple and, and, and someone said, oh, I use a Samsung Galaxy. I can tell you for me, I use a lot of these digital tools, though for a lot of people, handwriting is helpful for certain tasks because of the connection between the brain and in what they call embodied cognition um, is maybe different handwriting. For keeping track of things, what I use different things for different for different items. For sort of my scrapbook, for things that I want to write about on my blog, I have a text message thread. So I text myself with those ideas because they often come up at a point when it's very easy to access text. For things that are more structured, I'll use a Google Doc, you know, that's by topic. Yeah. Uh, but for things I need to remind myself, I just use my my calendar app. It doesn't matter whether it's Apple or Samsung or no. you know whatever just as soon as it comes up, I put it in the app for a calendar reminder. Um, what I don't use very much is something like a to-do list with reminders. I've tried to, but for me, it didn't work. It worked for me either. And I really wanted it to. Those fancy apps just didn't do a thing for me. But like, for example, I will then create more lists. Like I was, I could never decide what movie I wanted to watch. And you know, it was really important during the pandemic because I was like, I, watching Netflix or TV was kind of the main thing, right? So I started just, whenever I, a movie occurred to me that I might want to watch, I created a new movie list and I share it with my husband and he could put movies on here too. So that when Saturday night comes around, I'm not going, oh, I don't know, what, what do we want to watch? Because we now have a whole list here, but it's only here because as soon as I think about a movie that sounds interesting, I put it on the list. And that that's the key. The shared tools are very helpful. Yeah. 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 
let's see um a, a question uh i'm not sure some some are specific some are general here's one for craig a uh, question for craig what kind of scheduling approach would you suggest for a ninth grader who's struggling with completing and submitting homework on time distraction in the form of minecraft is a huge problem and we the parents are not able to stand over our child 24 7. i'm i'm laughing because my kids really love minecraft and we had a kerfuffle on monday because my my 10 year old didn't follow uh the list uh and I, I actually think he was playing brawl stars i personally try to encourage them to monetize their gaming but uh what do you think craig <laughs> No, it's a great question, and it shows you, you know, the goal is we would like our child to play less Minecraft so they can focus more on their academics, right? So that's easy. No, it's not at all. So what, what happens is that when I – no, it's really complicated. So what typically what happens when I talk to parents, um, there's lots of different things that I have to find out about the family dynamic. So – one, it's it, what. What are the expectations, right? Is is this child allowed during a concrete time to play Minecraft? Is there a schedule? Maybe there's not a schedule. So one, you have to have that conversation, and maybe the family has to sit down and have a discussion. Like, what are the rules uh, for the family? So that's one. Um, and then let's say you decide that Minecraft is not allowed uh, during during the child's school. Um, and then the child clearly knows the rules, but is accessing Minecraft, then what's plan B? Um, because maybe if they have access to it, again, they can't developmentally control themselves because there's that impulse, which is age appropriate for a child that's nine. Um, there's ways that you can use apps that will shut out, um, depending on the device, certain, certain uh, websites. Um, and then if you do that, you have to explain to the child that they don't feel like they're being punished in, per se. So it, it, it gets, it really gets convoluted. Um, and then from there, I, I find in general for, for, for children um, that are struggling to stay focused, I, I find not only is a conversation with the family or families, the, the, the first step, uh, the second piece is really how to minimize the distractions because the distractions are significantly interfere with um, the child's performance. And again, as I mentioned during one of my slides, it depends on the child's age. Teens are the number one priority are their friends, right? So you also have to be aware, sometimes parents, um, as Grant mentioned, um, they may say, oh my God, you know, my 15 year old is constantly on the phone or whatever, texting, you know, their friends. And from a parent's perspective, it's like, you know, they're embarrassed, but you know, maybe from a developmental appropriate perspective, like that's normal. Like I, I know it drives you nuts, but sometimes parents have to hear that these are normal behaviors. So it's again, it's 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 it's, a, it's this juggling act of what's developmentally appropriate, um, how these things are communicated, and and then again trying to enforce or modify the environment. You get feedback and you modify again and you see what works. Okay, let's see. Here's one for Karen. Thank you, Craig. Karen, thank you. Can you expand a bit on the organization and sustain steps? Well, now that's a that's a really that's a that's the uh, million dollar question, right? So of course, it really depends on. We've already assumed that you're not going into that step until you've already done the other two steps. That will give you a lot of information about what's important to you and how to keep things the way they are. Now. If you get organized on the surface, so your, your desktop is clear and your kitchen table is clear, but your drawers are full, then anything else that comes into your home doesn't have a place anymore. So you want to make sure that you have um, developed a system that allows things to come in and out of your home. I always have a donation bag in the closet, and if something's not working anymore, it goes in the donation bag. Um, if, if Food is purchased. It's not doesn't work out for us. It goes it goes into the garbage. Um, no matter what it is, if it's in our home and we're not using it, I ask myself: Is this worth the amount of space that it's taking up? So it's really about allocation of space and making sure that anything that's you know, if you live in New York City or you live in a big city, your apartment or your home is costing you a lot of money per square foot. And if you have appliances that are on your kitchen counters, 
that you never use or you use once a year and it's taken up a square foot of space on your kitchen counter, then you're paying a lot to take up that space. So it's really about allocating space, deciding what's working for you, what's not, what you want your days to be like. So for example, if, um, if you have to move things to get to the coffee cup that you use every day, because you don't have a good place for your coffee cup, then that's discouraging. And that's not sustainable because what's gonna happen is your coffee cup is gonna end up um, just sitting on the kitchen counter all the time. Flat surfaces should be for activities only. So your kitchen counter should be used for preparing food. Um, your dining room table should be used for eating. You right. Anything else, and that's fine, you can move it. Um, you can move your homework away so that you can eat. But if you have a system where every flat surface in your home becomes an, a storage opportunity, then you're never gonna have a sustainable system. So once you've gone through the first two steps, you've edited and then you've decided how to make things work best for you organizationally, then sustainability um, is a matter of upkeep. And it again, goes back to these five minutes, right? So no matter how yep. well I may think I am, stuff gets out of order here. But in five, if I can get the, the entire appointment in order in 20 minutes, I consider that a well-organized town. Okay, speaking of five minutes. So five <laughs> minutes, so five minutes. We have, five, we have less than five minutes left today. Unfortunately, this is obviously such a huge, important topic. Um, and there's a bunch of questions I see Craig is answering by text, by typing. Thank you. Um, just to remind people, I hope this will be on Neighborhood Psychiatry's YouTube channel, and I'll share the recording with our with our panelists uh, as well. Um, so there's a big question about tips for overcoming avoidance and procrastination uh, brought about by anxiety. I'll, I'll answer that very briefly because you know that could be a whole uh, hour webinar in, in itself. Maybe we'll do that. Um, you know, managing the anxiety is one of the things as well as, as Karen and Craig are talking about setting oneself up, up for success. To, one of the things that people have difficulty with, I'll say briefly, I, I think, is they, they want to use their, we want to use our willpower to overcome obstacles. Um, and sometimes that's helpful, but really what you want to do is go about four or five steps before you reach the point of wanting to use willpower and set yourself up to succeed. So the example Karen gave is like um, make your space physically um, matching your, you know, your workflow so that you don't create obstacles for yourself. That's just one, one tiny thing. Of course, you know, in a small Manhattan apartment, not, not all of us have ample work surfaces or storage. And then you can be more creative about, um, about uh, engineering your environment. Um, so let's see, I, th I, think, um, I think we're just wrapping up. Any final words from our panelists? Yeah, I'm going to jump in. Sorry. So what Grant, just to piggyback what Grant said is that, so people hear the term executive functioning or executive functioning coaching. And just because you're like, all right, I'm disorganized. I need help. I'm ready for executive functioning coaching. There are prerequisites um, for those that they may need to partake in before they start executive functioning coaching. And we do, that happens. We, I speak to adults, I speak to adults that have teens and there are many individuals that are not ready to be coached. They have to work on their, maybe their mental health. Um, they have to work on, um, again, maybe creating enough space to take care of themselves because it's not something that uh, Grant said, you can't just will yourself um, there is something on, someone asked about YouTube. You can YouTube, for example, the wall of shame. A lot of speakers talk about that. It's this emotional wall, it's blockage, and it can get a very complicated. So sometimes people aren't aware that there are huge walls, lots of obstacles that might need to be worked around before you start executive functioning coaching. Karen, any final thoughts? Now, I would just say, again, just give things a try. Um, I absolutely agree with what everyone has said about um, the, the individualized process that everyone goes through. Um, and, you know, like I said, I think whatever information you get from trying things and recognizing what works and what doesn't is really valuable. It's not a failure. Um, we are all on this journey and, and we, we 
gather information and use it um, to the best of our ability. And, and it's really just about self-awareness. Very good. Very good. And so much more to say. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, Karen. Thank you to all of our attendees for your great questions. I hope we covered everyone's questions a little bit. I don't think we got to all of them. Uh, and again, Neighborhood Psychiatry has a YouTube channel. The full presentation, tech uh, gods permitting, will be up in a couple of days, if not sooner. Uh, and you have contact information for Craig and Karen. Craig Selinger, Karen Sochi. Uh, we shared their limp links. Uh, and if you go to the registration email you got, I believe their contact info and bios are there or, you know, easy to find by searching online. So thank you very much and good day. Take care.